The second speaker in today's session is Roman Bartek. Roman. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy that you s are still here for the last day of the conference. So my name is Roman Bartak, and this is a joint work with uh, Adrien Maillard, uh, who was uh, our postdoc, and Rafael Cardozo. And it's about uh, validating hierarchical plans uh, using uh, attribute grammars. Uh, so I believe that uh, the task is quite clear. So validation means that uh, we are given a plan, a sequence of actions, and uh, we are given an HTN model. And the question is if this plan complies with the HTN model, meaning there is some task in the HTN model such that if we decompose the task, we got exactly that plan. So this is the task we are solving. So what's the motivation? Why this problem is important? Well, maybe eventually HTM planners will find their way back to the IPC. Uh, so then we need to validate uh, what the planners are producing. And even if it's not part of the competition, if anybody is developing a new HTM planner, uh, it would be good to have an independent tool that can validate if the plan generated by the planner is, is actually is actually correct. Uh, but we can also look at the validation from the other perspective. So you may know that your plan is definitely correct and you have an HTN model which may not be complete. And you may be asking, uh, is this HTN model corresponding to the plan? Is it possible uh, to generate a plan using the HTN model? And if not, maybe we need to modify, we need to modify the HTN model. Uh, obviously, uh, these validation techniques are somehow the first step to, in general, plan recognition or go recognition. So you, re you, you recognize a subsequence of the actions and you are asking what's the task that that agent is, is going to solve. And you may say, okay, so what's new there? I mean, this is not a new topic. Uh, there are already people uh, trying to do uh, plan recognition and go, go again and goal recognition. But when you look at the papers, uh, you will see that uh, they are not actually covering full HTN. It's, uh, at least I believe it's almost always a subset of HTN. Something, something is missing. So I believe this is the first approach that do really a complete validation. So you may have uh, all the constraints in HTN and you can validate the plans against them. And we use the concept of attribute grammars. So what is an attribute grammar? I guess you know from the uh, undergraduate course uh, the notion of, of, uh, of uh, context-free grammar, uh, which is very nice, very simple. An attribute grammar is an extension of context-free grammar. And this extension is based on adding attributes to symbols non-terminals and terminals. So these attributes can be used to communicate information between different branches of the decomposition and they may be also uh, connected or restricted by additional, additional constraints. So let me show an example of the power of attribute grammars. So this is a famous context-free grammar for generating or recognizing words starting with letters A, then following letters B, and then following letters C. Obviously, we don't need a context-free grammar. It can be done uh, using finite set automata or regular grammar. But it looks nice using a context-free grammar. And you know that if we do a small modification in that language, meaning if we require that all these letters appear in the same number, so it's a to the power of n, b to the power of n, c to the power of n, we need to go away from, uh, from context-free languages. We need to go uh, to, uh, to context-sensitive languages. But if we use attribute grammars, we can just slightly modify the grammar to generate this specific language. And this modification is based on adding attributes that are counting the occurrence of the letters. So we say, okay, generate an A letters of A and B of letters of B and C of letters of C and all these numbers should be equal. Okay? So this is the constraint and then we just generate independent letters A and we count them and the same for B and for C. Uh, so those of you who know how the context sensitive grammar looks for this language, it's not that natural, but if we do it in these attribute grammars, we keep the same, uh, the same simplicity of, uh, of context-free languages. Uh, so what we suggested is using attribute grammars to model HTN. So we already heard about HTN, so it's a natural candidate to be described in uh, using uh, like context-free languages because of the hierarchical structure. So that's nice, but we have uh, additional constraints in HTNs, and these constraints cannot be covered by context-free languages. And we know it 
formally. So formally we know that the language generated by HTN is not context free. So we need something more. And now we know that attribute grammars are enough to model, to model this. Uh, this is an example I'm going to use. You don't need to look into details, but basically uh, we are moving containers between locations and we have uh, one task that is called task uh, move, move two containers, which consists of two subtasks, move one container and move another container. And moving the container means moving the robot to some location loading the container to the robot, moving the container to the other location and unloading it, okay? Uh, and uh, so this is the task that I will be using and uh, uh, it's very natural to encode this uh, using grammars. Again, we are not the first ones who did it, so there are many approaches that are using grammars uh, to describe HTN. So I said, okay, I, I believe it would be easy to use attribute grammars, but then when we look at the papers and we realize that actually nobody is really covering HDN in full complexity, right? So uh, that's a question. Maybe you will tell me that yes, yeah, there are grammars that can do it. And one of the major problems we notice uh, that these grammar approaches are not covering is what we call task interleaving or action action interleaving. What does it mean? Okay, this is an example of uh, of this uh, transfer to containers task. And you can see it's decomposed into two subtasks, transfer one container, transfer the other container. And this subtask is decomposed to task load the robot, move the robot, and unload the container. And this one can now be decomposed just into two tasks, load and unload. We don't need the move action there because we can use the move action from the other task. But if you want to do it, we need to interleave tasks degenerated from one branch of the grammar with tasks with the other one. Okay? And this is what's not context-free, so we need something, something stronger there. And uh, using attribute grammars, we can do it. We use the concept of timeline, how, how, how to do it. Okay? So this is the task interleaving, what I call, or activity, activity interleaving. Uh, so just to briefly describe how we, how we, uh, how we encode HTNs as uh, attribute grammars, it's actually very natural. So if we want to say that the transfer one task is decomposed to these three low drop, move drop, unload drop, uh, primitive, uh, primitive task, we can do it using this rewriting rule. Uh, obviously there are already some constraints, so you can see that this task is about robot R, which is the same robot here and the same robot here, so there are already some, some equality constraints, but there are some other constraints that we can express, like partial ordering constraints, so we have precedence constraints, loading must be before uh, moving, moving must be before unloading, which is linear sequence in this case. Uh, and then we have uh, some type of causal constraints, uh, like the before and between, so the before constraint tell us that before this action, actually not this action, this task, something must be true in the state. So when we decompose the task, before the first action of that decomposition, this predicate, this atom must be true. Uh, which is not that complicated, it's like a precondition, but the between constraints are more interesting, so we can specify that between two tasks, some condition must be preserved. So this is especially important if we insert something in between. So it should not destroy this precondition. Okay? So we can say that between loading and moving, this predicate must be true. Whatever we insert in between them in the, in the, in the, final, in the final plan. Okay? So it's very natural to encode HTNs, like one-to-one -one translation of HTNs to, to attribute grammars. Okay, so let's go to what we did in this paper. So we are doing validation of plans and we use parsing. So parsing is an approach to recognize whether a given, uh, whether a given sentence belongs to a given language described in this case by, by a grammar. Uh, it's done in a bottom-up bottom -up way. So we basically collect terminals, in this case actions, together and we form tasks, so we are somehow building the hierarchical structure from the bottom uh, to, to, the, to the top. Okay? Uh, so this is for the hierarchical structure, but what about the constraints? Uh, what we do is that for each task we keep what we call a timeline, which is a sequence of slots describing the states that are somehow generated when we are executing, uh, when we are executing this, this task. So these slots contain uh, actions from the original plan and they also contain description of state right before the action and effects of the action, which is useful to check, uh, to check the, uh, the, cause of the cause of constraints. And the slots might be empty if we don't know yet the action because uh, we will need to interleave something from another branch there. So we may use an empty, empty slot. Okay? So the idea is that uh, we have the rules 
we have the, the set, of ta set of actions corresponding to the initial plan, and we are trying to group them. So we try to find a rule such that the right-hand side of the rule is matching to some subset of activities in this set of activities we have. And if it's possible and all the tasks are satisfied, we can group them together and we can generate a task corresponding to this. Okay? And we need to obviously to merge the timelines and so on. So I guess the best way how to describe the algorithm is to, uh, to show an example. How is it working? So let's start with this simple plan, two load operations and the move operation and then two unload operations. Uh, so the first step is to generate the initial primitive task with the, with the slots. So we have uh, five of them. Uh, there is always the name of the task. Uh, these indexes indicate uh, to which activities this task spans. So this is just uh, w one activity at position two. So that's why it's two and two, and you can see it's like uh, it's four and four. And this is a precondition of the task, and this is the effect of the task. So we can fill them to the slot because we know that the state before the action must contain these, uh, these uh, atoms, and the state after must or must not contain these atoms. And now we try to group them. So let's use this rule that I presented before. So it has uh, uh, three tasks, load, move, and unload. So we can find them here. It's like this load, this move, and this unload. Obviously, the names of, uh, of, uh, of objects needs to match, but there's also another trip like this one, right? So we can load, use this load, this move, and this unload, okay? So we can combine everything which is possible. So I just selected the first three that I showed, and we combine them together, and we generate uh, or we prepare a new task, uh, transfer one, and you can see that now this task spans from one to four, because this is the one, three, and four. So we fill the slots for this task, but the slot two is empty. We don't know what will be there yet, okay? So this is the first part, but this is not enough. We need to check the constraints that are behind the decomposition. So we merge the timelines, and now we have the constraints. So we are checking them simply by looking at the timeline. So if the constraint says, okay, before loading, something must be true. So we look before loading, oh yeah, it's true, so it's verified. Uh, this between is more interesting, so between loading and moving, something must be true, okay? So actually it's true at this state, but we don't know if it's true here, so what we do is we put it there, right? Uh, for future, to know that this must be true, true in future. And we do it with all the tasks. Obviously, obviously the, the precedence constraints can be verified as well by checking the indexes, okay? And the next step is actually using the information that the plan is flowing, meaning from one state to another state we go by the actions. Uh, so this is the classical uh, condition that the next state is calculated from the previous state by removing and posit uh, negative effects and adding the positive effects. So we can actually propagate this information. So this is a description of this classical uh, relation between the states, and using this we can propagate information between, be between the states. And we can go in, bo in, in both directions from left to right or right to left, okay? So for example, uh, in this case, uh, we know that uh, the predicate at is deleted, so what we do is that we remember in the next state that it should not be there, just in case that in future we will try to, to add it, okay? So we can propagate the information through the timeline from both directions, left to right and, and right to right. Uh, the, the, the same is happening here, so we deleted something, so we should remember in the next state that it should not be there if we try to add it, add it later. Okay, so this is the, the principle of the algorithm. If you're asking, is there really some algorithm or is it just about pictures? Yes, there is an algorithm. Uh, you can find it in the, in the paper. I have like one minute, so I will go one by line to explain it completely uh, because it's not just this algorithm. There are many auxiliary procedures around, like merging the slots and, and so on. But I guess it's more interesting to see if it's really working. So yes, it's working in theory, but we already implemented it and we compare it with the only validator for HTNs, which is uh, part of the Panda system. Uh, this validator is based on translation, the validation problem into SAT, and it has been presented uh, last year at, at ICAPS. Okay? Uh, so Panda can do the validation, but uh, as far as we believe, it's not uh, complete. Uh, it does not cover these between constraints, as far as I know, and some other constraints are compiled away, so we are actually not validating the original plan, but uh, the plan after the, after the compilation. Okay? And we use just two planning domains to do the comparison, and we measure runtime both for valid and for invalid, invalid plans. 
Okay, so this is the result for the supply domain. Uh, it's uh, it's a runtime in in seconds. It's logarithmic scale. Okay, so this is the Panda system. You can see not big difference between valid and invalid plans. Uh, the same for our system. Uh, there is slight difference for Panda. It's more complicated to to verify valid plans. For our systems, obviously, it's more complicated to validate invalid plans because we are generating many many other tasks there. And it looks like we are one order of magnitude faster, even if the runtime are now, now much better. And for the transport domain, it's more or less, more or less the same. So to conclusions, uh, now we believe we have the first uh, validator for complete HTN models with all the constraints. So whatever constraints have been introduced in HTN, uh, we should be able to model, to model them. So perhaps it's more interesting to look what, what to do next. So obviously, uh, right now the answer is yes or no. If it's valid, it's perfect. But if it's not valid, we just say it's not valid. So it might be more appropriate to return where is the problem? Uh, the problem can be in the plan, but the problem can be also in, in the model. Uh, we can go to partial plans. Right now we require a complete plan uh, in the input. So it would be interesting if it's possible to extend this algorithm to partial plans, like give me the prefix and I will deduce what task I'm going to do. Maybe the partial plan may be even not correct, so there might be missing actions or there might be wrongly recognized actions or actions that are actually not belonging to this domain at all. And uh, based on this, obviously, if you know the task, we can predict what's the next action, which I believe it's very important for any security agencies and so on to predict what you are going to do. Uh, but for us, it's probably more interesting uh, to look at the other direction. And this is uh, what should be modified in the model to comply with the plan. So we know the plan, we have a partial model, but we would like to know what needs to be added to the model such that we can cover that plan. So I believe this is more interesting era for, from the knowledge engineering perspective. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Time for a question. The talk and for the example inspired by our boat trip yesterday. Can you hear me? Now, yes. Yes. OK. Thanks for the talk. Um, the correspondence between the attribute grammar um, is a complex result. And your algorithm is a huge algorithm. So do you think there's a role for mechanization and actually implementing this in tools like Isabel and Koch and Hull uh, so that we have some trust in plan validation tools and in the equivalences between the various formalisms? Yeah, actually, what we proposed originally was using attribute grammars to model workflows. And we hope that it could be somehow unifying framework to modeling uh, many techniques. Uh, it's quite natural to describe classical strips-like domains in, a, in attribute grammars. Now we can describe HTNs, we can describe workflows. So we can use it uh, as, a, as a tool that can translate maybe between, between different formalisms. And obviously the idea is that if you, if you design the algorithm for this unified model and you want to verify whatever you want in, in your formalism is just enough to write the translation and you can do verification through this. So that's somehow the hope to have a unifying framework uh, such that we can translate between, between different representations. Uh, we can also, the reason for grammars is we can learn something from the linguistics and uh, these guys that are using grammars or they use it, that now they use deep learning a lot, but uh, when they use the grammars they develop a lot of techniques so hopefully we can learn something from them uh, for other areas like planning. So that's, that's my, uh, my vision for this. And I have a video too.
And the third paper in the session is a journal track paper. Thank you. Morning, I'm Jose Carlos Gonzalez, and I'm going to present you a joint work with Fernando Fernandez, which is my thesis advisor, and Jose Carlos Pulido. This is part of the journal track of five caps, and I have the opportunity to show you the now or now therapies project. So at first, the first, the first thing that I want to show you is a, is a video to see how our architecture works. So here we go. So this is what, uh, what we have. Uh, we have a, a humanoid robot, and the aim of this robot is to perform uh, rehabilitation sessions autonomously for children with, pro with problems with their upper limbs. So we have uh, a 3D sensor in that wooden uh, support platform that we have, and the robot uh, says, please, uh, do you have to put this uh, position with your arms? And then the kid tries to imitate him, it. And if the children can't, uh, d doesn't have exactly the same position with, the, with his arms, uh, with, the, with her arms, then we can change, we can uh, correct the position with our 3D sensor, and the robot says, hey, you have, to, you have to correct your right arm or your left arm, for example. And in a second attempt, or any kind of, att uh, of attempt, in fact, uh, the robot can imitate the, the, ch the, the child, so it says, hey, I've seen you that you have your arms in this position, so you have to put them in this other position. Um, the motivation of this work is that uh, th this kind of children have uh, problems like uh, cerebral palsy and brachial plexus palsy, and they have to perform a lot of different rehabilitation uh, sessions. They are very hard, boring, and they have to do it in, in a very small time window during their lives. So it's very important to maintain them uh, motivated and, and uh, to, to reinforce their commitment with their treatment. So this kind of, uh, of projects are very useful for therapists uh, because of the motivation, but we also are gathering all kind of information from, uh, from the 3D sensor so the therapist can see their evolution in, uh, in, uh, uh, along all, all sessions. So at the, when we started with this project, we contacted with a hospital, uh, with a Spanish hospital, and they have this therapeutic procedure for this kind of, uh, of, of children. So the physician first uh, uh, performs a diagnosis of these uh, patients, and after that primary evaluation, then determine the objectives of the therapy. For example, if they have to train more bimanual exercises or, or unimanual exercises for coarse grained uh, things like that. And then a therapist has to uh, design the therapy. And the th a therapy consists, consists in several sessions with uh, a lot of exercises. And each exercise is, are suitable for different uh, therapeutic ob objectives. And then after defining each session, they have to execute it. So they just execute the sessions with the children and uh, they, make, they can change also the, the previously uh, scheduled uh, exercises depending on the evolution of the, of the patient. So we took this into account by creating a, 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 a three-leveled uh, architecture. So uh, and the, or the, the, main, uh, the, the most important part of our architecture is that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, all based in planning. In this high-level planning, we have a therapy designer in which the physician just says, uh, just say, I want this, to get this, this kid to be trained with uh, that unimanual exercises or things like that, and then the, ther the therapy designer, just the output of that module, is the, the whole therapy with all of the sessions with, the, with its, uh, his exercises. And uh, then uh, in step B, we have the medium level planning, which is the actual ex execution of those uh, sessions that we have uh, planned before. So in that decision, sup we, we have a decision support there, so we gather all the information from the environment, from a 3D sensor, and also from the robot, and then we transform it to low-level actions that uh, the robot can understand. And, that, uh, and of course, we have there a low-level planning, which is, which is transparent for us, because it's just a path planning, for example, to move one arm from, uh, to, from one place to other place. Um, so I'm going to explain uh, the high level first, then the medium level, and the low le I'm going to uh, say just a few insights about the low level because it's not very important for our work. So for the therapy designer, which is the high level of planning, we have sessions, as I've told you before, which have exercises that have a maximum duration and a minimum duration. 
And they have also phases. So they can be uh, suitable for a warming up phase, then a training phase, or for a cooling down phase. That must be respected in, a, in, a, in all of the sessions. And then all the exercises also have poses. And a pose, we can say that it's a cycle of pose set by the robot, then the perception of the pose uh, of the children, an evaluation if the pose is correct or not, and then the correction if needed. So also we have a variability and patient constraints. The exercises can't be a re can reappear in one session to, uh, in one session to avoid the boringness of the session. And also the exercise distribution should be assorted through sessions. So that's why we want vari variable uh, uh, sessions uh, among all the therapy. And also we should avoid a group of exercises that the children couldn't, uh, couldn't perform. So this is the output of our high-level planning. We have all of these sessions and, uh, on the exercises that some of them are suitable for, uh, for the warm-up phase, other for the training phase, and for the cool-down phase. And how we, do, uh, how we did that? So how, did it, uh, how can we guarantee the therapeutic objectives that the physician uh, uh, inserts into the system? Well, for that, we define the therapeutic objectives cumulative level. That numbers there, which is bimanual, fine unimanual, coarse unimanual, things like that, are indicated by the physician directly. So he, say, he says, for example, I want uh, 15 points of bimanual, 13 points of fine unimanual, and 5 points of coarse unimanual. Okay? Then each exercise has an adequacy level for, for each one of those uh, therapeutic objectives. So, uh, we can have an exercise which has, for example, one point for bimanual, five points for fine unimanual, and things like that. Each exercise also has a duration and a value of intensity and difficulty, which is uh, determined by, the, by each uh, therapist. And, of course, the group of, uh, of the exercise, too. Uh, to avoid them if needed, if the, if the kid can't perform them. So the goal of the problem is to reach the respective TOCL by summing all of the adequacy levels for, uh, for all the exercise of each session. So if we have, for example, three uh, exercises in a session with five points of bimanual, then the bimanual part of the session will be accomplished, so we can guarantee that the, that the kid is going to train accordingly to, to, the, guide, to the guides that the physician gave to the system. So, yeah, we have a planner, and the planner has to choose with, the, with an exercise database that we have previously po uh, set. And then the output, as I told you before, is just the planned sessions with also respecting uh, all of the warm-up phase, uh, training phase, and things like that. And, of course, uh, reaching the, the um, well, accomplishing the TUCL's reachability property. So, for that, we created an HDN. We tried to do it with PDDL, but uh, we found that we, we, we made a heavy use of numerical fluence, so, uh, so the, an HDN works much better in, in, in our case. So first we generate the therapy, then the session, then the, H, uh, then the exercise for warm-up training and cool-down uh, cool phase. And of course, uh, each, uh, each exercises, uh, the, pay, the, the, the exercises that are planned for, for a centering phase are suitable for them, so we can uh, achieve that curve that it's shown there uh, with a low and, and soft difficulty at first and at the end of the, of the therapy. So this, the, the, that was for the high-level uh, high planning. And I want to, show, to explain you the medium-level planning in which each, each planned session that we, uh, that, we, uh, that we managed to plan with the, with the previous uh, level are going to be executed. So we are using classical planning here with replanning. And each of these actions are some examples of actions that we have in our PDDL domain. So we have a welcome stage in, wh in which the robot says hello and presents it, uh, itself and then start the training. And in the training stage, it, at first it introduces the exercise that, is, uh, that they are going to do and they start with a cycle of uh, set the pose and then they correct the pose if needed and so on. And then finish the, finish the training. So this is our module that we, or, or the schedule of, of the system that we have for, for the medium level of planning. Uh, we have the, that executive that gathers all the information from the environment, from the 3D sensor that we have, and also from the robot, and extrapolates some exogenous predicates like uh, correct pose, detected patient, and things like that. So then it uh, completes the all state of the world and 
sends, uh, sends it to Pilia. Pilia is a sub-architecture that we have for planning and learning uh, and, and replanning that we developed in our group. And it's a very, fra it's a very mature framework uh, to work with now. So when the state of the world uh, reaches our decision support, then the monitoring uh, uh, module checks if it is compatible with the rest of our, of our planned actions. And if it's not compatible, then, uh, then it uh, sends again to decision support and we plan uh, an, a new plan. So we, now we are currently using metric FF. And these are, in the, in the bottom part, these are our medium level actions, as we, I've told you before. And then when the decision support sends, sends the next action, it's decomposed into low level instructions for a robot, like say, play audio files, set angles from vision, things like, things like that. And as an insight for our low level planning, um, uh, it's independent from the robotic uh, platform because they are generic low level actions. So they can be interpreted by similar robots. Of course, they should have uh, arms, but also for uh, virtual avatars or thing, uh, systems like that. And we have tested with the Now robot, with the Ursus robot, which is a customized, ro customized robot from, uh, from uh, a Spanish university, and also the RIM robot from PAL Robotics. So the journal paper conclusions is that uh, we had an autonomous, uh, an autonomous system that can drive therapeutic sections previously planned by itself. And the control was addressed in uh, three abstraction levels with planning. The high level was a therapy plan, uh, a therapy des uh, designer. The medium level uh, in which each session was controlled. And the low level, which was transparent for us, but uh, we, we did their uh, path planning task for, for the robot. And we had evaluated this with a large group of children, uh, a large group. Um, uh, we did, uh, in 2015, we did our initial tests of 120 healthy children in schools and three real patients in a hospital. So that was our first interaction test, only one session. And uh, children, of course, liked the, the system because, the, because it, it, it was very interesting for them to see it at the first time. But we felt that we, we should perform long-term tests to, to, to see if they can be um, engaged with their treatment. So then in 2016, we performed these long tanks with 12, with 12 patients in a hospital, two times per week for four months. And yeah, the children were motivated, but we felt that our sessions were uh, very repetitive. Uh, nevertheless, therapists were very interested in the project. So in 2017, uh, we, changed, we created a lot of new activities to perform with, uh, with the robot. And uh, we also uh, found uh, that the therapists were very interested in, the, in this one. And the children were, uh, liked it a lot because it was very different. Each session was completely different. We had a storytelling activity, so the, the robot uh, tells a, a different chapter of its own story, uh, its, its new session and of course different games. So things have changed in, in, in those years. So we made some improvements over the paper that I am, I'm presenting here, especially in the high level in which uh, now we can replan for high level events also. The, th uh, the, the high level event that I told you before was uh, planning an offline phase. And also in the medium level, now we have a fully declarative mechanism for our decision support. So we can, uh, for the execution and monitoring of the actions, and also for the refinement of the actions. So we could let, ultimately, with, uh, with a graphic user interface, uh, something like that, the therapist to create new activities for, for the robot, and it will work. And we also make interruption of actions in the middle of the execution, and as I told you before, new games and activities. And now we are independent also from the 3D sensor, not only from the robotic platform. So as a future work, uh, we think uh, we want to develop a fully generic multi-level control architecture because we find that uh, each, uh, that um, not, not only with three levels, but also with an arbitrary level of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of hierarchy, and also compare it with, uh, with our control systems. We are now currently working in, in a system like that. So these are our references, or some of the words that we have published, and that's all for my part. Thank you. Questions? Um, I was just wondering how you, because you said that 
uh, in, the la in the third phase of your study, you ensured that the robot always does different uh, exercises every day to have a yes. little bit of... Um, 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 how do you ensure that? So, so how do you algorithmically ensure that the exercises you do on, a, on the second day are different from, from the if ones they, you do? How, how can we ensure that the children were, are, are more committed with their, yeah. with their treatment? Yeah, it's difficult. It's with, uh, with questionnaires and also asking with their, with their therapists. In the third evaluation, that was the, the, was the bigger one, uh, each of the children has, a, has its own uh, therapist and uh, they were completely different. They, they, can, they don't know each other. And uh, after all of the of the tests, we we found that they they like it to go to to the. It wasn't a hospital. It was in a university. It was a, a rehabilitation summer camp. But we found that they were they were very interesting. The problem here is that we can uh, we can assure that our system uh, is uh, is apart from motivation is good for the children, because chi this kind of uh, children has to do a lot of different exercises like sport for example, so we can't, uh, we can't uh, isolate our system and say, yeah, definitely this works for this kind of children. So the only things that we are measuring here are the motivation and, of course, the, the usefulness for the, for the therapist with, uh, with, the, with, our, with our system, by creating a, a, a graphic user interface for, for them and so on. Since I injured my back recently, could I schedule an appointment? I, sorry, sorry? I said, since I in injured my back recently, may I schedule an appointment? <laughs> yeah, you could. <laughs> you could, definitely. <laughs> we are also thinking on, on use uh, this system not only for, for physical rehabilitation, but also for other kinds of rehabilitation, also for other, uh, other types of, of, of patients. But we have focused on children because, of course, the, 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 way, the way they interact with the robot is much more natural than adult people. But, uh, but we are trying to focus also on, on aut our, um, autistic uh, children because some of them are more... Uh, it's easier for them to interact with robots instead of, of, of people, maybe because of their condition. I'm not an expert with that, but therapists say that. Thank the speaker again. Thank you. That ends the session. Lovely work. Sorry? Really nice work.